Hello everybody and welcome to Chess Openings Explained. I am Nick Risco, one of the instructors here at the St. Louis Chess Club. I'm filling in for Caleb Denby today as he is on vacation. He will be returning uh, shortly to come back to teaching the openings. Tonight's lecture is going to be over the Shveshnikov Sicilian, one of the sharpest and heavily theoretical lines of the Sicilian and one that the world champion Magnus Carlsen likes to play from time to time. Okay, so we're going to jump right into the opening. Uh, the first couple moves, we're uh, kind of going to go over them uh, shortly, uh, or quickly rather, because um, they should be well known. Uh, this is a line where black plays knight to c6, um, and after the trade in the center, both sides are going to have knights developed. Black trades off this flank pawn to try and get some development. White trades off the center pawn to get development. Or sorry, black trades off the pawn to get center pawns. <laughs> My bad. Um, both sides develop nice to the center. And after a pawn to e5, this is one of the characterizing moves of the Shveshnikov. The e5 pawn is grabbing some space in the center and more importantly, attacking white's knight. So here the question is, what should white do with this knight? Uh, you might see some more beginner level players play the knight back to f3, which can be playable, um, but white can go for something more. They can go for something sharper, more aggressive. And the main line here, you will notice uh, white plays knight d to b5. And uh, let's see the chat, see if anybody kind of has an idea of what knight to b5 is about. All Sicilian lines are super theoretical. This is correct. Most Sicilian lines are theoretical, been heavily analyzed because the Sicilian is one of the top weapons against e4. The cubby Z says knight d6 is the idea, and they are correct. If black allows it, white is going to try and go knight d6 with check, and then after bishop takes d6, the queen will take on d6 and kind of cramp black's position. It's going to be hard for black to get space in the center and castle. So to prevent this, uh, there's a very important move here black has to play. In order to prevent the knight from getting to d6, black must play pawn to d6 themselves. Occupy the square with the pawn. That way, if white takes, they can just take back with either the bishop or the queen, and white will lose a piece. At their pawn to d6, another very important move for white to play in order to maintain control of the center is developing the dark square bishop to g5. And this creates a pin on the knight on f6 to the queen. So this knight on f6 cannot move, and the reason this is important is it will help solidify our pawn on e4, and more importantly, is control the d5 square. You'll see this d5 square becomes a very nice outpost for white's pieces in the future. After bishop to g5, black will go ahead and play pawn to a6. Now this may seem kind of an odd move because it's not developing a piece. It's moving a pawn on the edge. This is not our classical opening principles at play here. But this knight is kind of cramping black's position. Black wants to get it out of the way. And so now white has to retreat the knight. The only square this knight can go to is a3. And now black will play the move pawn to b5. After pawn to b5, black is threatening something. I'll ask the chat to see if they can find the threat. Fork by Maximiliano. Yeah, I don't know who is saying h1, but uh, for those in the chat who are saying pawn to b4, that is the threat. Pawn to b4 is going to fork the knights, and because knights can't move diagonally, uh, they cannot capture this pawn. So on this move, you'll see white play a prophylactic move. They'll develop in the center um, in response to this threat and play knight to d5. Knight to d5 is a very nice centralizing square for the white knight and it's adding more pressure to f6, this pinned knight. If we can add enough pressure, then capturing on f6 may be useful for white. Uh, someone is asking about a uh, variation with bishop to b7. So what happens if bishop to b7 before this variation? Uh, I don't know what line they're asking about because bishop b7 isn't even possible until b5 is played. And so knight d5 is response to b5. 
if bishop to b7 here, uh, let's see, what happens? Uh, probably a capture on f6 to ruin the pawn structure would be good enough. So bishop to b7, with that line being given, is not the main move here. The main move here is bishop to e7, breaking the pin and reinforcing the knight on f6. Uh, okay, Eric Murdoch says, sorry, they meant e7 with the bishop. Um, so let's see, if the bishop goes to e7 before here, so I, I would assume bishop to e7 before b5 um, here. Uh, not the main line, but I believe most players will play knight to c4, and the knight will come and develop in the center this way, possibly going to e3, looking at an outpost on d5 or f5. Some other players may opt to capture on f6 uh, and try and target the d6 square again, but it would take a little bit of time. They would need to develop the queen and castle queen side to give sufficient pressure. Okay, back to our main line here after bishop e7. After bishop to e7, white is going to make a move that may look confusing to some beginner players, and especially players who are crazy about the bishop pair. If you never want to give up your bishop pair for any reason, um, this move may look sus to you. But the move is bishop takes f6, and black normally captures with the bishop. What is the purpose of this? Um, the purpose of this move is, again, try and reduce the pressure in our center. So this pawn on e3 does not have a protector after knight to d5. So once this pin is broken, the knight is threatening to capture on e4. So bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, our pawn on e4 is safe. Black can also try to capture with the pawn. And white can adopt kind of a fianchetto setup after g3 and develop the bishop to g2 and castle. Um, or develop the queen forward and castle queen side may even be safer because black does have this open g file. Okay, bishop takes f6 and now we start getting into the first main, um, I guess, deviation for white. So far, this is the top move for white the entire time, but here... White kind of has two choices, both involving the c-pawn. We have pawn to c3 and pawn to c4. I'm going to ask the chat which one they prefer and why. See which variation we can take a look at first. Why might these moves be useful? I'm Annie saying, yes, moves c3 and c4 are options here. Does anybody know the difference between them? <laughs> we have Philippe saying he wants to go C4, Amir C4. So we'll take a look at the C4 line first. C4 is absolutely playable by white. Uh, I believe it's the second most popular choice in this position. And the games may continue as follows. The pawn will advance to B4, attacking the knight on A3. The knight must move, so it reroutes to c2, and the pawn goes to a5. That way, white doesn't get away with winning a pawn here. To develop the light square bishop, uh, white will fianchetto because you don't want the bishop coming, staring at your own pawns. You don't want it to go to d3 where it's staring at nothing. You want to try, try and get it to g2 and see if you can create life for this bishop in the future. Black castles kingside. White goes bishop to g2, the plan stated earlier. And black will go bishop to g5. Now that black has secured their king, they have this move to go bishop g5 and prevent the knight from trading itself for the bishop. It's not the end of the world if uh, white gets this trade, but black would rather retain the bishop pair. It's one of the, um, I guess, one of the nice features of the position for black is their bishop pair. Here, white castles kingside. The knight goes to e7, and this is kind of a dual purpose move. One, you want to get white's knight off of this nice centralized outpost. The other reason why the knight would go to e7 is to help prepare this f5 push. This f5 push is going to be a resource for black to try and generate activity in the position. That way black isn't just shuffling their pieces mindlessly and passively. Knight c to e3, and the idea is if the black knight captures on d5, then white's knight can recapture and maintain a strong knight in the center. Because black is trying to avoid a knight on d5, black will sometimes take on e3, 
and it would be better for the knight to recapture. You don't want to have to recapture with your f-pawn. While it's true this opens up a file for your rook, these pawns are going to be a long-term weakness, and this e4 pawn is not helping the life of your bishop. So after bishop takes e3, you'll see the knight take e3, and the knight can always come back to d5 in the future. And then the last couple moves that are common is bishop to e6, putting pressure on the c4 pawn. It's already protected, so queen to d3 just overprotects. That way this knight can maneuver in the future, if you so please. Queen dc7 to add more pressure, and rook a to c1 to secure this pawn. And this position has been theorized as a equal position. Um, and we'll look at the c3 lines, but one of the main reasons why the c4 line has been, um, I guess, less played is because of this problem with the pawns on the light squares and white's bishop on the light squares. This can lead to some pretty rough bishop endgames for white. So if you do play c4 as white, that is something you're going to be mindful of. The main move, we'll go back to our main line, the main move is pawn to c3. And part of this is to kind of prevent black from pushing on the queen side, and more importantly, creating this reroute square for the knight that we saw in the c4 line. Uh, here, black can choose between castles or bishop g5. Um, those are the two most played moves, and they just transpose into one another. Black can choose the order they play them in. Black will castle, and white will play knight c2 against both responses. And now the bishop will come to g5 here in this line. And I'm just going to take a minute to pause here, let people kind of soak up the position, uh, try and see if they can find the ideas for both sides, and take a guess at what two moves are playable here. We have the main line, and there's a very fun side line that we're going to get into if we have enough time. We'll see if chat has any recommendations. Luke Pitts says pawn to a4, which is the main line. We'll see if anybody's able to find the side line, if they know it exists. h4. We have people suggesting king b4, which would be a feat for white to play. Unfortunately, it's uh, not doable. Queen h5 or resigns. Queen h5 is not the move. Great Wolf says let's push Harry. I like it. So there are two moves here. Again, the main line is pawn to a4. And this very fun sideline is pawn to h4. So we'll actually uh, work our way through the sideline first, because we do have a lot of meat to chew through with the a4 lines. But pawn to h4, and there's a little trap here. If the bishop takes h4, uh, white is winning on the spot. We're going to give you guys a little time to see if you can find it. I think I saw it whiz by in chat, but uh, it disappeared before I could read it. Um, but after uh, what seems to be a free pawn, black is already losing. We have Sugar Bear requesting knight to e3. Um, which knight is the, uh, the question I'm going to ask to Sugar Bear. We have Music Guitar and James Burbano saying queen to h5. And this is correct. Queen to h5 is a winning move for white. And the reason is... Um, you now have two attackers on this bishop. You have the rook and the queen. It's only defended by black's queen, so if black doesn't do anything about it, then they're going to lose a bishop. And if they move the bishop back, then it's mate and one. So here in this position, black is already struggling after queen h5. They can try bishop f2. King takes f2. They're still down a piece. And now h6 to stop the mate. But here, when white is up a piece and has development on the table, this is going to be a very fun position for white. So bishop to h4, or takes h4, is obviously not the main line. Uh, surprisingly, it has been played a lot in the Lee Chess database by uh, amateurs. Um, but as far as the master database goes, masters are pretty smart. I don't think they're going to be taken on h4. The main move here is going to be bishop to h6. We do have someone asking, what if they play g5 in this attack, which is a very good question. If g5 is played, simply pawn to g3 and the bishop is trapped. Okay, back to the main line. Bishop h6 is the main line here. 
And now pawn to g4, white is just going to be really aggressive and try and push to attack this bishop. And here there is really only one good move for black. Very often you will see black play g6 and this just cannot be the correct approach. After pawn to g6, the dark squares are being weakened and white has these two pawns ready to go and crack up black's defense. So after a move like pawn to g5, bishop to g7, here after queen to d2, you're developing the queen ready to go, you're getting ready to push h5, you can even just go knight c to e3 and bring in more pieces. See if you can get it on to g4, maybe sink it in on h6 or f6. So all of white's pieces are going to be flooding into black's position. So g6 is just too passive. Black needs to make sure they're being active. And I'm seeing this move pop up in the chat over and over. Everyone's suggesting bishop to f4. And this is the main move in the position. Um, here, queen to f3. And black is actually going to be looking to sacrifice a pawn here. Um, they are going to consider allowing white to take twice on f4. So here, bishop to e6, developing, and this is the point of the pawn sack. You're sacking the pawn, that way you can develop the rest of your pieces. And here, knight takes f4, pawn takes f4, and queen takes f4. You'll see the knight come to e5, kind of uh, stop the queen from putting pressure on d6, because if uh, you know white gets the chance to castle queenside, the rook is going to end up on d1, and d6 is a target. So knight to e5, just kind of to disrupt this influence of the queen on the position. And this is a relatively equal, equal position here. All right, let's go back. Uh, losing my place in the study. So that covers uh, most of the h4 lines. Um, I think there's one variation of the h4 lines that I'm missing out on. But I'm going to move on to the a4 lines because, like I said, we do have a lot of lines uh, in the a4 variation to cover. Pawn to a4 is the main line, the Shashnikov Sicilian, and most theoretical positions arise after pawn to a4. And the first move you'll see black play in response is b takes a4. This again also breaks some of the classical positional rules. So here you're taking a pawn and you're capturing towards the outside of the board, which is not um, how you're raised uh, classically with um, classical principles. Your pawns typically want to capture towards the center. So my question is, why, why doesn't black just allow white to take? So why not like play bishop to b7 and allow white to take this pawn here? What would the issue be? Let's say bishop b7 and allow white to take. Amir notices that this line loses a pawn. Amir, can you give the full line, please? Ethan Liang is saying that one reason is it's an isolated pawn, and two, you're just losing a pawn. So yeah, everyone is seeing that it is hanging a pawn. If they allow white to take, pawn takes, pawn takes, rook takes, excuse me, rook takes a8, and let's say bishop takes a8, then bishop can take on b5. This is a plus one position for white because they are up a pawn. And um, I think it was, uh, I think last name was Liang. They were saying that uh, even if like this bishop weren't able to take on b5, this pawn would be an isolated pawn on the b file. That would be a great target for white in the future. So this is why you will see black capture towards the edge. Black doesn't want to lose this pawn, so they have to trade it off on the a4 square and white will recapture with the rook. It's a little odd to see the rook just capture moving forward like this so early before the king is even castled, but it's going to be pretty rare for white to castle in some of these lines. Black will play pawn to a5 to secure the pawn. Uh, now you have three pieces protecting the a pawn instead of just the rook and the bishop. And white will start developing some of their other pieces, starting with bishop to c4. Here we see rook to b8 putting pressure on white's b pawn. So white plays b3 to secure it. Uh, the bishop will protect from in front. And here we will see black play uh, king to h8. 
And again, I'm going to ask the chat, what is Black's plan with King to H8? It seems a little bit of a weird move, as it's not really developing anything. Black still has this light square bishop to develop. They still have a queen that they might want to try and get off the back row soon. This rook on f8 is not on an open file yet. Kai is suggesting g6 and f5. I, Manny LP is saying it's stepping out of the night checks. Music Guitar is saying prophylaxis. So it's kind of a mix of all of these. Um, the night checks is not the biggest thing in the world. Both of these squares are covered multiple times by black's pieces, by the bishop, the queen, the knight, the pawn. Those squares are definitely covered. It's actually more about discoveries in the future. Black does want to try and play f5. They actually don't need to play g6 first. Uh, they can play f5 right away because the bishop on c8 is protecting the f5 square. However, after pawn to f5, say like they play pawn to f5 here, it can run into some discoveries such as knight to e7. After knight to e7, king h8, and then knight takes c6, white is going to be up a piece. With a fork, they're going to go up an exchange, eventually being up a rook. So king to h8 is prophylaxis um, to help black play this f5 idea. Next, we will see white play knight c to e3. This does a couple things. One, it is supporting the knight on d5 in case black plays any knight to e7 maneuver. And it's also protecting the f5 square, so it kind of deters black from playing f5 in this position. Now, we will see the idea of pawn to g6 to help this f5 push. Pawn to g6, um, theoretically, can also be considered an inaccuracy due to this um, upcoming sacrifice that I will show. Um, but first, we're going to show the other line besides g6. Um, the other line here is bishop to e6. Just, again, um, cutting off anything with this f-pawn, this open diagonal, uh, trying to put pressure on this d5 knight, maybe trade it off. The downside to that would be that uh, after the knight recaptures, white still has a good knight. Um, Actually, sorry, the move isn't bishop to e6. I misread my notation. The move is bishop takes e3, and then knight takes e3. So again, the f pawn doesn't take. These pawns would be a little ugly for white in any sort of end game. So the knight recaptures. Knight to e7 now, prepping f5. White castles, pawn to f5, trades on f5. And now we see rook to a2. This rook is going to eventually swing over to d2 to pressure this weak d6 pawn. So we'll see bishop to e4, rook to d2, rook to b6 to defend, rook to e1, just getting the rook onto a semi-open file, queen to b8, and queen to a1. This position is known to be slightly better for white. So back to our main line, g6. Again, theoretically can be considered an inaccuracy, but is probably black's best try. Here, white has this move, pawn to h4. Again, we see this pawn to h4 sacrifice. Now here, um, after bishop takes, we no longer have queen h5. After queen h5, black is simply winning after taking the queen. Uh, someone is suggesting g6, h4, bishop h4. And then g3 can be rough. So this is actually the line that I'm going to be covering tonight. Is uh, after bishop takes h4, the pawn comes to g3. And this right here, this sequence of moves, is a battle for tempo. White is trying to make sure they can open lines for their pieces to flow freely into the black position. And black is just trying to get greedy and take the material. So if they can survive the attack, they may have a more fortunate endgame. So after g3, bishop goes to g5. The bishop could go to f6, um, but this also allows white to kind of just get their hand at attacking. Rook to a2. f4 is going to be the idea with swinging the a rook over to h2. <laughs> yeah, Memento Mori is saying epic rook swing incoming. This is going to be a big idea in the Shveshnikov for white. This huge rook swing. How many other openings do you get to take a rook on the a file and move it all the way to the h file? I can't think of any others off the top of my head. You'll see the bishop drop back to g7, not really wanting white to take and then sink their other knight in on d5. It might be a good peace trade for white. Pawn goes to f4. 
again, we're seeing the path clear open for the, for the rook. And uh, if black takes, white can take back and more lines are opening. Rook to e8 will put pressure on the e-pawn. White's going to ignore it and continue the attack on the h-file. h6 is probably the only way to stop this attack currently. And after a queen to f3, protecting the e4-pawn, uh, king to g8, stepping out of fire of these rooks, and queen to g2, this position has been known to be much better for white. Um, Stockfish 12 right now is giving this an evaluation of plus 2.1. So that is why you'll see the bishop come back to g5, getting ready to trade itself for the e3 knight if necessary. Pawn to f4, again, battle of tempo. This f4 pawn is hitting the bishop, so black has to respond to this. e takes, g takes, attacking the bishop yet again. The bishop cannot take this pawn, because the knight will take. I mean, he's making the joke that, uh, this opening is like theory until a draw occurs, and yes, some of these lines are worked out to draws. We actually will show one in just a few minutes here. But uh, after the pawn takes back on f4, this bishop needs to find a home, and it's going to check on h4, and white has a decision to make. Here, white uh, has already declared they're not going to castle. This rook is just too involved in an attack, and this rook has already moved. This king is going to be hanging out in the middle of the board. But uh, now the question is going to be, where does white move their king? I'm going to leave this question open to the chat and see what ideas they have. We don't want to block the second rank, says Memento Mori. Amir is recommending king to f1. I'm Annie is coming in again saying king d2 looks safer, but king f1 still allows the rook swing. More people are suggesting king to d2 just because it looks safer. So good arguments for both sides. All right, people are still split on king d2 or king f2. Some people are suggesting king e2 if you get the chance. King e2, uh, I, I haven't looked into king e2. Um, the old main line used to be king to d2. The newer main line is king to f1. So first we'll, we'll look at the old line and see why why they switched to king f1. So king to d2, uh, we had a lot of people saying that king to d2, the king looks much safer. I would have to agree. Just aesthetically, this looks much safer for the white king. The drawback is it does slow down this rook swing. You know, the rook wants to go to a2 and swing over. So if you're going to play king to d2, you're going to want to think about a king to c1, and this is another tempo you're going to have to spend. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through uh, the rest of the old king d2 line. Um, knight e7 has been played, followed by queen to g1. Knight takes d5, knight takes d5. Bishop to e6. Queen to h2. Pawn to g5 to protect the bishop. And here, white can just take on g5. And the position gets very sharp very quickly. Uh, black will capture on g5, checking the king. The king has to move, it goes to c2. Uh, pawn to h6, again, just stopping any kind of mating ideas, supporting the bishop, the bishop will defend the pawn. So now this, you know, sacrificing the queen isn't going to be a good idea for white. We'll see rook a to a1, rook to g8, trying to see if it can do anything on this semi-open file. The bishop's blocking it right now. Rook A to G1, and now uh, white may be looking at capturing on G5 in the future as another sacrifice. Rook to G6. This rook lift is very important as it will help protect the H6 pawn. The knight will come to F4, looking to trade itself off for some of black's pieces. Uh, white is trying to trade off this knight that, while good in the center, isn't really contributing to the attack it might benefit white to be able to trade it off for some of the pieces black is using to defend with. 
After knight to f4, we will see the bishop take. The queen will take on f4. The queen will come to f6. And we see this little tactical exchange here. White takes on g6, allowing the queen to hang. Queen takes queen. White is currently down a queen for a rook. But after rook h to h6, black is forced to recapture with the queen because otherwise black is just mated. There's nowhere to move the king. Once the queen takes, then the rook will take back. King comes to g7. Uh, I guess the most popular move, or the book move, some would call it, would be rook to h5. It's just staring at the a5 pawn. And now after bishop takes c4, pawn takes c4, this position has been worked out to be an even end game for both sides. So earlier we had people talking about how uh, you know, it's all theory until it's a draw. This is one of those lines where it has been worked out to this equal, equal end game. Yes, book moves in the end game memento. So that is the king d2 line. And after years of this line being played, um, players have decided that instead of king d2, they might score better chances with king to f1. Trying to speed up this attack, leave the second rank open for their rook. That way they don't need to spend another tempo, say, moving it to the back rank or needing to maneuver the queen around to bring the rook in on the first. <laughs> it's like the Berlin endgame, but three times longer, says Manny. Here we will see black play pawn to f5. So this is the big break. Black has been trying to play this entire time. They've been preparing f5. Now they got it. After pawn to f5, uh, you will again see white ignore this threat on the e-pawn and just bring the rook to a2, getting ready to swing it over to h2. F takes e4, doing a couple things for black. One, it's winning a pawn right off the bat, and two, it's opening up this file for the rook. So it's not like white is just getting this crazy crushing attack for nothing. Black does have this counterplay that white needs to be mindful of. Luckily for white, their attack comes a little bit sooner. They swing the rook over to h2, and you will see black play pawn to g5, again protecting this bishop. This is a theme that we have been seeing in the other lines. And now um, that this pawn is no longer on g6, this allows the queen to come all the way to h5, join in on this attack on the, on the h file here, and just again, keep putting more and more pressure on black's king. I never said this was going to be an easy opening for black. <laughs> uh, here, the main move has been rook to b7. There is a couple other alternatives here, uh, mainly knight to e5. I think knight to e5 is an alternative here. Uh, of course, white cannot take this knight because of the pin. So, to make this a real threat, white moves the king to e2. After king to e2, black has a couple different options. Um, here... Um, probably one of uh, the least successful is going to be bishop to g4 check. This forces the knight to recapture as it is a fork between the king and queen. After the knight captures on g4, the other knight captures on c4, bc4, and queen c8 will put some more pressure on white's position, hitting the knight and the pawn. The knight on the g file will come over to e3 to protect c4. The queen will move to d7 possibly trying to come in on the A file. Queen to H6, and Rook to F7 to defend on the seventh rank. This position is about plus one and a half, depending on how long you let your, your computer think. It could be more, it could be less. Um, but again, this is not um, theoretically the best line for black, the bishop to G4. Another try from black in this position. Uh, another line for black in this position is um, knight takes c4 right away. After knight takes c4, instead of capturing back on c4, it would be very, very tempting to take on c4 right away. Um, you'll actually see black capture, or sorry, white capture on g5 first, trying to uh, weaken this h file more, really, really trying to mate black. Rook takes b3, just trying to get the pawn. Um, you're also wanting to make sure this knight isn't going to be attacked by a pawn. And then also trying to get access to the second rank. You may see uh, black try to get on the second rank and trade for the rook on h2 to try and 
trade off uh, kind of a passive piece for an attacker, one of the better ways to stave off an uh, attack. Um, but here, just rook takes h4, and white is going to have massive pressure on the h file. You'll see like rook to b2 to check the king, uh, but the knight can make its way to c2, give itself up. If the rook takes, then king to d1, surprisingly, sacrificing the knight, and there really is no good way to stop this queen coming to h7. You'll see the knight come to e3 and check, but the knight can take, and after the queen makes its way to the seventh rank, just knight takes c2, and white is just going to be up a rook. So knight e5 has been played. Those lines typically don't look so great for black. So black goes for rook b7, just immediately defending h7. And over the course of uh, the rest of these moves, you'll see both rooks and the queen make their way to the seventh rank to defend this, uh, this pawn over here. King to e2 by white. The main idea is just breaking this pin. Uh, it would be rather unfortunate if this file rips open and black, uh, what, yeah, black starts checking white, starts attacking uh, the other way around. Because you'll notice white's pieces aren't really doing a whole great job of protecting the queen side. Um, most of the pieces, at least all the heavies, are focused towards the king side. You'll see black play bishop to e6, trying to develop this bishop. Again, trying to trade itself off for some of white's good pieces. Um, it's also kind of making white not want to move this knight, because then a capture on c4 can ruin some of the pawn structure. If the knight recaptured, then it would hang the b3 pawn to the rook. And here you will see the move queen h6 by white. So there's a couple reasons why this might be. Um, one of them is to just put pressure on the rook right away. It makes it a lot harder for black just to bring the queen up and defend. For example, if they do it right away, then just queen f8 is going to be mate real quick, like bishop g4 and knight e7 will, will help the mate. So here, bishop to g8, bringing in another defender to the h7 pawn. Uh, and here, uh, again, a couple other moves instead of bishop g8. Uh, one of the more interesting ones may be just bishop takes right away, but after knight takes, rook f to f7 to defend the 7th rank, and queen e6. Uh, at first, the engine is all over the place. It doesn't know how to evaluate this position, but I believe this was seen in a correspondence game and it saw white win um, due to the pressure. So bishop g8 protecting the h7 pawn, and now you'll see white kind of give up control of this h file. They still have it secured, but they also start focusing on other points in black's position. The move here is rook to g2, getting ready to put more pressure on the g file over here. You'll see bishop takes d5, knight takes d5, and knight to e7. Again, black is just trying to trade off these attackers. With this rook no longer on h2, there, there aren't any ideas of sacrificing on h4. So it's going to be harder for white to break open the h file. That's why black is able to get away with removing a defender off of this h7 pawn, in case anybody was wondering. Rook takes g5 is a example of a sacrifice. This bishop cannot take because of checkmate. So this pawn is hanging. Here you will see black play knight takes d5 and rook takes d5. Just moving the rook out of danger because now that this knight is off of e7, um, this rook all the way over on b7 is protecting the mate threat. So you do have to move this rook. It is under attack. You just move it to recapture the piece and it is safe. Here, the only move where black does not lose right away is bishop to f6. If you are playing this as black, bishop to f6 is a must. You'll see um, white play rook d to h5, again, putting more pressure on the h7 square. This is a constant target for white and what black is constantly trying to defend. The best move here is queen to e7, so the queen joins in the defense. The rook cannot come up to f7 because of the bishop, and this is just giving away free material. Um, so queen has to come up to defend. Why doesn't rook h4 work, asks Max Emiliano. 
Um, on which move? Let's see. Um, probably after knight takes d5. I think after knight takes d5, people are wondering why rook takes doesn't work. And this is because knight takes on c3 with check, and black will start getting some counterplay in the position. Let's say the king goes, king goes f1, so it can't be checked by the knight. Pawn to d5 is going to start getting these center pawns rolling, cut the bishop out of the attack. And again, currently, um, the, the rook does control the mating square. So hopefully that answered Maximiliano's question. We'll recapture here on d5 with the rook, bishop to f6. Rook swings over to the h file, queen e7 to protect h7. And here, white is really just trying to find every resource they can to break through. And you'll see the move queen to g6. Uh, at first, it looks like you're hanging the queen, but this pawn is pinned. And you will see black um, play queen to g7. An alternative may be just bishop takes on c3, uh, but I, I'm not sure the, the theoretical value of this move. Queen to g7 has been the uh, theoretical main line. After queen to g7, queen takes e4, getting the pawn, and it might look like you're just giving away material. Um, there's a move here that black has that looks like it, it's winning. Um, but there is a way out of it. So I'm going to give the chat just a little bit of time, see if they can find this, um, what looks to be a tactic and what White's response to get out of it is. Does chat have any suggestions? What does black play here and white's best response? Someone is suggesting rook to e8. Unfortunately, rook to e8 just loses the game in spectacular fashion after queen takes e8. And now the queen has to block. And after the queen blocks, queen takes g8 is mate. So uh, no, rook e8 is not the move. Rook e7, yes, rook e7 is popping up in the chat. And rook e7 does look like it's going to win material. If the bishop just takes e7, then the queen can take, and white is going to be down a queen for a rook, uh, which is not going to be pleasant. There is um, two moves that white has here to get out of this. So we'll see, uh, see what people are suggesting. How does white get out of this sticky situation with this pin on the queen? Rook g7 check is not legal. We have some people suggesting bishop to e6. And we have some other people suggesting rook to h7. Both of these moves are playable. Both of them do solve this issue for white. Um, probably the, the sharper line is going to be uh, rook take to h7. This is uh, what, what, what I've looked at. This is what I play. Um, but bishop e6 is also playable. If the other rook comes behind to try and pile up on the bishop, then you can move the king out of the way and actually let this bishop go. Because after rook h7, uh, if queen h7, then queen is mate. And if the king moves down, then rook takes g7 with check, and the queen has time to escape with queen to h7. So again, both moves are playable. Um, but I'm going to go ahead with rook takes h7 here. Queen takes h7 is practically forced. It was a fork between the king and the queen. Here you will see the rook recapture, and here rook has to recapture because this g8 square, don't forget, is blocked by the c4 bishop. Rook takes h7, and here now you'll see the queen move to e3. Uh, just kind of getting control of some of the dark squares in the position, uh, looking maybe to come over to the G file in the future. And again, this uh, rook e7 idea um, is just shut down with bishop to e6 if the rook comes over. Uh, this time, without the rooks to help with the attack, you have to play f5 to secure the bishop. And here you're going to wind up in an end game where it is a queen and pawn for two rooks, um, which materialistically is equal but some may say that the position is better for white because 
uh, black's king is not active and nothing is attacking white's king. So queen to e3. I should also mention queen to e3 is also protecting the c3 pawn from the bishop on f6. Rook to c8, trying to put some pressure here, trying to prevent this bishop from moving. Queen to g3, like I said, the queen is just coming over to the g-file. And the last move is bishop to g7. I'm going to end the theory here. We're going to say that is a lot of theory to go over. We're going to let that sink in for a couple minutes and just enjoy what looks to be an even end game. Um, I will say the Shveshnikov is a very fun, sharp opening for, for both sides. Um, I know, I think Geary said a few years ago, I think it was back in 2017, um, I think it might have been at Tata Steel. He said that with the Shveshnikov, Black is struggling to, to maintain the attack, to get to a difficult end game that they need to maintain. So as Black, um, I know someone earlier in the chat was suggesting knight e7 lines. Um, I haven't looked at any of the e7 lines personally. Um, when I prepped my Shveshnikov work, um, it was against a co-worker who plays the Shveshnikov, and he plays um, these lines that I showed tonight. Uh, but yeah, if you are wanting to play as black, um, those knight e7 lines are probably going to be more useful. Uh, if you are white and trying to figure out how to bust the Shveshnikov, this is definitely a very fun attacking opening. This opening is one of my favorites to play against in Blitz. It's always a good wild time. Um, I'm going to give uh, chat a couple seconds to ask any questions that they may have. Um, if you have any questions about specific moves, please make sure to put in the move number. Uh, we'll take a look at any alternatives that people have questions about. We'll see uh, if we can answer those in our last 10 to 15 minutes. All right, I am not seeing many questions. How far do I know this opening in my head? That's a very good question. So uh, I did mention I did um, prepare this stuff against uh, an actual opponent. So this isn't like uh, I just came up with this for this class. This is stuff in my opening repertoire. Um, as far as the main line goes, um, I probably know like up to move king f1, so on move 22. And then um, here, I, I really just have to try and recall the plans. I don't remember many specific move orders, um, but I do know that king f1, and then you bring the rook down to swing over for a big attack. Uh, what if white goes for the plan of short castling? Uh, on what move? On what move would white go for short castling? Um, Let's see, when is short castling even first available? So uh, you have to protect the pawn. King h8 is going for f5, so you, you have to play knight to e3 to stop f5. Pawn to g6. Um, so they're probably asking about pawn to g6. What if white short castles here? Definitely a very natural looking move, and it's not a horrible move. It's not like you're blundering anything. Short castles is playable uh, here in this position. The problem. Uh, I, not a problem. It's like one of the things you give up when you play short castles. It's just you, you get rid of this very sharp idea of h4. Um, so that, that is what white gives up. Um, kind of gives black a little bit of freedom to move around. Like black can instantly play f5, which is the break they were wanting to play before. Uh, and it's a little difficult to see what, what all white should do. Uh, I think computer is recommending rook to e1. Let me see if this is a book position. It is. It looks like the most played move is queen to d3, bishop to e6, and rook to d1. Queen d7, f3 is um, the main line. Pawn to f4. And this um, reminds me a lot of like a king's Indian defense type of structure over here on the king side. Uh, knight comes to c2. Uh, it looks like this knight, uh, where is this knight going actually? Looks like it might be trying to come to b5, maybe try and help pressure d6, but uh, me personally, I'm a little unsure. Um, but needless to say, I, I don't recommend short castles. Um, I do recommend h4. 
All right, do we have any other questions in the chat? Um, Paul Kulikov is uh, mentioning that there are some positions where white will take on f6. So back whenever the bishop is on f6, um, that white will take and give black doubled f pawns. Um, it, that is possible. Um, it, those can also be double-edged because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think I gave one of these lines where, um, yeah, the pawn recaptures and then uh, white tries and goes for a fianchetto setup. I think here in this line they're not, though. But, like, you just have to be careful. Black is going to get this rook to g8. Manny, just to answer your question, uh, thanks for the compliments. Um, this is not my first lecture. However, this is my first lecture in quite a while. Uh, probably about a year. I used to teach a lot um, on stream about a year ago, um, and then once the classes moved completely online, uh, I kind of took a step back, focused more on giving private lessons uh, instead of the classes. But again, the compliments are, uh, uh, are very nice. Thank you. Looks like uh, Yaroslav is saying they tried to play this position as black. Engine keeps saying it was plus one, and the games didn't go so well. Um, yeah, so I don't play this as black. Um, <laughs> yes, um, the engine does give white favorable evaluations in most lines. I feel if you were trying to um, go for the most equal line, um, you'd probably have to hope white plays c4. And after they play c4, um, kind of go into more of a, a positional type game where white's going to trap in their light square bishop. Um, this would be ideal. If they play um, c, uh, c3, um, you're probably going to have to play... Oh, where'd that line go? I don't know. Probably hope they play king d2. Again, like I was saying, um, Geary in 2017 was... Uh, saying that you know this position is very difficult for black to get to a very difficult end game for black so definitely not my top recommendation but it is very good at the club level very fun very sharp play by both sides um, so hopefully this was a good intro to the Shveshnikov for everybody um, again thank you all for the compliments i think i am going to wrap it up here with a couple minutes to spare at the end going to take a short break and then we're going to come back with tactics time where we're going to talk about how computers just don't know anything about chess we're going to have some uh, nice puzzles that computers can't solve and i'll see you guys there thank you for stopping in have a good night <laughs>